But uh, the questions are, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you several uh, Royce questions. One is about, and let's just start with this, say something about what you think the importance of Royce is to uh, philosophy and to culture and to academia. Well, Royce was a, an important figure because he did a lot of very important things, uh, such as uh, logic. He's a very important logician. Uh, Can I stop you? Yeah. Getting a lot of shadow. See where that shadow is, Randy? Mm hmm Yep. So I'm um, going to be looking more this way. Yeah. yeah. So I told you, just, I walk just to my left of the, of the camera there. Well, I'll tell you what we can do. Come here, look that, at it, Randy. Yeah, I'd say, say, let me get in the middle over see, here. When he was looking, go ahead and look where he was looking at over here. When you was looking mm -hmm. around, okay. no, 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 I want you to see the camera. Oh, okay. And you look over turn, this, turn way, this way, how you was looking at him. Yeah, 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 okay. And then, well, here, I'll tell you what, talk to me. I'm going to be right on. here. Turn, <laughs> turn is that, is that better? Yeah, turn back again and face mm -hmm. this way. No, like that? No, just, just straight on. Mm -hmm. straight on. There we go, so there we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, there we go, there, there we go. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's good. Some shadow is good, a lot of shadow not good. Sure. That's better. Let's check that one, I think. He's set up. I can't oh, sell his yeah. headroom. I need more. Head uh, I think you need something. You need to. You've got. You're cutting off the top of his head. Just uh, There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah that, that'll do the trick. And, yeah, okay. All right. <clears throat> so I will. Sit here so that who's the audience, by the way? Is this the general public? Is yeah, it's it's, it's anybody who might give us money, basically. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, thanks a lot. That's a lot. That's yeah. A lot of help. Well, it's crowdsourcing. You know, you know mm -hmm. about you mm -hmm. know about that. So uh, so so essentially, that's what we're shooting for is uh, uh, is uh, disseminate the website, and then make sure that it has that it has the needed impact mm -hmm. on people, uh, so that they say this is something I want to I want to give ten or twenty or thirty bucks to. All right, so <clears throat> so anyway, we'll start again. So say something about, and by the way, my questions are not going to be included in this, and so you need to use the names a lot. Yes, yes uh, reiterate the question yeah, and, and, and answer. Yeah, right, right, yeah. okay. All right, so the, the first question is say something about the uh, importance of Royce to culture, to academia, to history, to mm -hmm. philosophy. Josiah Royce was a very important person, not only for philosophy, but also to historians, uh, and to uh, American culture more generally. Um, he was a wonderfully important logician. Uh, he did some things that we're still trying to sort out in terms of, of what can be done in the field of logic. He was an historian. Uh, he wrote uh, important uh, documents about the history of California. And by the way, uh, born in California uh, in the uh, mid-19th century, uh, he was one of the first persons born west of the Rockies to get a chair in a major university on the East Coast. Uh, very important kind of thing because he had a sensitivity uh, to American culture that went beyond uh, the East Coast. He had a, a strong sensibility of place, which was, of course, uh, is, of course, very important among uh, the uh, philosophical school called pragmatism. Um, I would say also that Royce is primed for uh, rediscovery in this time that has been called our post-secular age. Some have suggested that um, the uh, age of secular society uh, has come to a point where uh, more and more religious thinking will be a part of, of national and international discourse. And Royce is prime for that because he wrote very sensitively about uh, aspects of a religious experience. That's pretty good. So what will a digital critical mm -hmm. edition bring to the rediscovery or, uh, of Royce, or uh, uh, how, how does this serve the public, academia, uh, uh, anyone who wants to understand America? Well, of course, uh, if one wants to study first, one can get... Uh, let's take that one from the top again. <laughs> let's take that one from the top. I got the question. Right, yeah. yeah. Of course, if one wants to study Royce, uh, one can go and get the books. Many of them are in print uh, and even in paperbacks. But the question is, what? How do they fit together? Uh, what are the uh, what are the differences between uh, various uh, editions? What are the differences between the drafts of those books and the print editions? 
Uh, in an electronic edition, you can get all of that. You can see the way that Roy's changed his ideas through time. Uh, you can compare one edition against another. Uh, you can compare the drafts against the, uh, the print edition. So these are wonderful sources. And I would also say that in a critical edition, and this would be an electronic edition in this case, that you can have uh, a, uh, a study of his bibliographical references. Now, uh, in the days that Royce was writing, it was not always clear uh, what books he was for referring to. The standards of, of citation were not the same in those days. But in a critical edition, editors who are trained in this area and are real professionals when it comes to, to uh, uh, running down these sources are able to compile uh, through very sophisticated means. For instance, uh, they'll go back to uh, dictionaries. They'll go back to uh, various bibliographical sources of the time to find out what Royce was reading, what he's referring to even obliquely. So for the serious person who wants to understand Royce's place in philosophy, in American culture, and in a culture more generally, I would say that these are uh, the tools that are really required. And I will add that it's also searchable. Uh, perhaps most importantly, you want to find out what he thought about a certain aspect of logic uh, or uh, a certain aspect of the history of California. You just put in the character string and you get the results. That's pretty good. I can't imagine what else we would need. Um, say something about the Dewey Center and what the mm -hmm. Dewey Center does. Well, the Dewey, uh, the uh, the center for. Let me start that over. Okay. The center for Dewey. Uh, <laughs> Jet lag, man. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. The center for Dewey Studies was founded in 1961, uh, so we've been at it for a while. Uh, my successor, Joanne Boydston, and her team edited 37 volumes. I think you're going to want to say your predecessor. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm just, my head is still somewhere. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's in Spain. In <laughs> Dallas, Fort yeah. Worth. I'm okay. sorry. All right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. okay. The Center for Dewey Studies was founded in 1961. Uh, Joanne Boydston and her team, between 1961 and 1990, edited 37 volumes, the complete works of John Dewey, the complete published works. Uh, since that time, we've been editing his correspondence. Uh, which is now up to four volumes and some 26, 27,000 uh, letters, uh, both uh, from Dewey, addressed to Dewey, and some third party. We're now editing his uh, lecture notes. His students were prescient. They uh, hired a stenographer to take his lecture notes down. So you see a very candid Dewey there. Uh, we also invite uh, researchers from all around the world to visit us, and we've had many, many visitors from over 30 countries. Uh, in the last few years to uh, visit us to spend any uh, amount of time from one day to, oh, even a year here doing uh, various uh, kinds of research at the center. And these would include not only philosophers, uh, not only educators, but also people who are interested in ec economics, people who are interested in public policy, people who are interested in environmental philosophy, uh, in gender issues, all of these issues. Uh, are, can, can be found uh, as uh, important elements in uh, Dewey's uh, work. Uh, and uh, there are also those who are interested in, in the details of Dewey's life because he was a fascinating person, knew lots of very important uh, people. And during the time of his 80th birthday, the celebration of his 80th birthday, uh, he was hailed by the American, by the New York Times, as America's philosopher. Mm -hmm. So the center it mm -hmm. does does critical editing, but it does a lot more. The center does a lot. Uh, the Center for Dewey Studies has many, many projects underway. Um, I just got back from Madrid yesterday. Uh, we were uh, celebrating the inauguration of our ninth international center for Dewey Studies. Uh, we now have center, sister centers in China, uh, Japan, uh, 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 Germany, Italy, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Argentina, and now Spain. And we're negotiating for additional centers in London and in the UK and also in India. So we have, uh, we have many contacts around the world. And if you look at where these places are, many of them uh, are in places where there is a continuing struggle to, re to, to define and redefine what democracy and education means uh, for their cultures. 
several years ago, I was coming back uh, from Europe uh, on business, and I uh, came through immigration in uh, uh, O'Hare uh, Airport in Chicago. And the customs person asked me, or the immigration person asked me, what is your business? And I said, I sell the tools for democracy and education. And that's what we do here at the Center for Dewey Studies. That's pretty good. All right. Good. Thanks. I think we've got all we need.